Hello. Everything I know about live streaming, I learned from my four-year-old friend, Maya. Maya had been traveling in some uh, countries with a serious um, caseload of the pandemic, and so she was broadcasting for two weeks while she was quarantined. Um, and so I'm going to follow Maya's <laughs> format. So number one, hi, I'm Nancy Clark. I'm live streaming from the Josephi Center for Arts and Culture in Joseph, Oregon. Uh, today is uh, April 21st. Feels like day 3000 of the pandemic, but I understand it's really only about five. A wonderful amalgam for some ink that I made. We'll talk about that later. Uh, number two, the weather is beautiful. So uh, I hope you all are just taking a quick lunch break. Uh, to be with us for this um, brown bag from the Josephi Center. Uh, and let's see, Maya's number three was always, what's the story for today? Well, the story for today is printmaking without any art supplies. So the story is that I walked in here to the Josephi Center on, I think, sometime about the second or third week of March, and my good friends, uh, Rich Snyder and Cheryl Coughlin and Megan Wolf and Pam Beach were wringing their hands saying, we have to close, we have to close. There's a flu epidemic, there's a core, uh, the virus epidemic. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna continue to have um, a presence in our community fostering the arts if we can't gather? And so, of course, Rich being Rich said, you know, Nancy, can you make prints at home without art supplies? Uh, we could video that and, and broadcast it, and being who I am, I said, sure. Uh, and now I have spent the last week trying to make that a true statement, because the truth is I had no idea if you can make prints at home <laughs> without art supplies. So that has been my journey, and uh, what I thought we would do today is I'm going to take about five minutes uh, just to talk about printmaking in general. What is it? Why do people do it? You know, what's different about it? What does it contribute to the art world? So that's just to give us kind of a big picture. And then I'm going to go through my journey of trying to figure out how to make prints without any supplies. That was my, my goal. I couldn't cheat. Um, and uh, so, well, I'll share that with you. I would just want to say that there are at least, what, 10,000 uh, YouTubes out there on how to do this. Uh, so this is not gonna be a teaching session about how to make your ink or how to do this or that. It's just gonna be, I hope, cheerleading for what fun it can be to give yourself a new challenge and uh, how to be creative in this uh, new world that we live in. So, so what is printmaking? Um, printmaking is a, a two-dimensional art form and it usually involves some kind of a plate, a matrix, a piece of metal, uh, a piece of cardboard, a piece of plastic, and you've got something like this. Then you make marks in it. We'll talk about that in a minute. Are there different ways to make marks? Then you take ink and you put ink over it in different ways. And then you take a piece of paper and you put a lot of pressure on it. And then the ink transfers from the plate to the paper and you've got a print. So its unique features are um, that it's, uh, you can, it, it's different from other kinds of art. When you paint a picture, you paint a picture and then you've got a picture. But with printmaking, you can make multiples because you've got this matrix, you can re-ink it, you can make another one. So printmaking has been around for a very, very, very long time. Um, if you count uh, your hand as a matrix, and you count some sand mixed with animal fat as, um, as ink and a cave wall as a, a print. Uh, it's been, I don't know where they're pushing the number back to, uh, eight, 9,000 years old for, for the caves in France. And I think it's being, being pushed back any further. So printmaking has been around a really, really long time. There's not a famous artist that didn't dabble somewhat in printmaking. Uh, it's been all of the great artists used it for um, some period in their life for sketching or for sharing their prints. So, so it's been around a long time. Um, so I'm going to very briefly just tell you about the different kinds of printmaking. So one of the really interesting ones, fun ones, is etching. So etching usually involves a metal plate like this, um, and then you use either traditionally you use acid 
to burn little teeny tiny crevices in here, little teeny tiny ones that I can feel with my finger. You probably can't really see them. Um, and then you push ink into the, into the crevices. You wipe away all the stuff that's on the surface. And then you use a lot of pressure, lots and lots of pressure. You really need a press to do this. And you'll get, and you can see that with etching, you can get some really fine lines, uh, which is a real characteristic of etching. Uh, it's probably not something that you will do at home unless you're comfortable with acid. Uh, I do know some people who uh, use roof cleaning materials to etch zinc. Um, I'm not going to do it. I don't have any gloves that thick. Um, but that's etching. Uh, a second kind is uh, relief. Relief printing is a lot of fun, has been around a long time too. Generally you take something like wood or linoleum from your floor or um, uh, some rubber kinds of things and you carve them. So with the etching we made marks for the things that we wanted to have ink. With relief you do the opposite. You cut away the things that you don't want to have ink. Then you rub ink over the surface of the plate. Where to put my plate? Like this. And then uh, put your paper on it, pull it away, and you have uh, an etching. So this is black ink over a piece of linoleum that had carved little lines in it over some colored paper. So that's relief printing. Now, you really can do relief printing at home without really any tools. Um, just as an example, you can take the bottom off of the the little tray that your meat came in or that your vegetables came in, nice little soft styrofoam. You can take a toothpick. You can just push right into the styrofoam like that. Take a sponge, dip some sponge in some ink, sponge it over like that, and if you're careful and don't get it into the cracks, then put the paper on it and you've got a, a relief print. So that's a real easy uh, way to do uh, printmaking at home. Um, a third kind uh, would be uh, screen printing, planograph. That's what you've seen everybody's t-shirt. You know, the t-shirts, the movie posters, uh, yeah. those are done on a screen printing technique. Uh, and you really do need some special equipment for those. So I'm not going to really talk about those today. And uh, the, last one I'm, the last one I'm not going to talk about, that doesn't really make sense, but is lithography. So in lithography, you're using chemistry that water and oil don't mix. So you take litho, stone, right? So you take a big stone and you put some grease on it and then you flush it with water and then you take greasy ink and you roll it on the stone and the greasy ink sticks to the grease on the rock, and runs away from the water and then you again you use pressure. This is an example of a lithograph that I did and you'll see it has really strong drawing marks in it. It looks like you've, you've drawn it with a grease pencil because you have. So that's a lithograph. So uh, unless you've got some really smooth stones and some strong presses, you're probably not going to do a lithograph at home. But what you can do at home, and what I want to talk quite a bit about, is the technique of calligraphy and uh, uh, calligraphy, uh, calligraphs and um, monoprints. So with, with etching, we went in to mark what we wanted. With relief, we went in to take away what we didn't want and use the top. With calligraphs, you put things on the top. So you take a plate and you put things uh, on the surface, then you roll the surface with ink and print this way. So this one was made with a piece of cardboard and some masking tape. And I just used masking tape in there. Uh, here's another example of one. I just used masking tape put it on a piece of plastic, rolled it with ink, and had a baby. Um, really fun, easy to do, this one. I took a piece of cardboard, I put on some lace, I put on some yarn, I put on some rosemary from the garden, uh, I put some leaves on it, then I wrapped it all up in aluminum foil so that the ink wouldn't stick too much. Then I rolled this with ink, and voila, kind of a crazy print. So that's a really fun one to do. 
Um, and you can take it lots of places. The last show and tell piece I'll use is the one that I combined. Uh, I combined cheesecloth with um, calligraph with wiping and um, I kind of like this one for the sign of the times about weaving and keeping our, um, our culture uh, mended as we go through difficult times. So this is a mixture. All right, so now what can you do at home without any supplies? Um, the problems we have to solve um, are several. The first one is plates. Well, that one turned out to be very easy. Plastic, cardboard. At one point, I just cut the back off of a cereal box um, and just used that when I was running out of cardboard. Um, you probably have some glass in the basement, um, uh, any kind of plastic, you know, off the greenhouse. You can use all of those things. So plates are pretty easy to come by. Um, paper gave, threw me for a while. Um, I just assumed I was going to use the paper that came off the computer printer. Um, but it was pretty awful. Uh, it bubbles, it wrinkles, it didn't really want to do a good job. So I went off searching for other kinds of paper. And it turned out to be pretty easy. Uh, gift bags are great. Grocery sacks are great. Got some old map, paper maps. You know, you're not using those anymore. They're great. Believe it or not, you can do some interesting things on a telephone book. Uh, tissue paper that comes with, uh, you know, all the wrapping things that are being shipped to us these days because we can't go out. So paper was pretty easy, and um, paper makes a big difference. So if you're trying something and it doesn't work so well, you pick a different kind of paper, and uh, you, you might see some new success. So the plates, the paper, the next challenge was ink. What are we going to do for ink? And um, this was quite an, <laughs> quite an exploration. There are a lot of YouTubes about how to make ink. Um, but the key things are that you need to um, have um, some binder and some color. And I played a lot with trying to figure out how to have a binder. Um, I took some egg whites and I whipped those with a little you know, hand whipper and got them a little bit frothy. Okay, so it works pretty well. What about parchment paper from the kitchen? Parch oh, you cook differently than I cook. <laughs> parchment paper is great. I just don't happen to have any, but that would be really good, especially if you then took a match, you know, around the edge and burned it. Look, that would be great. Um, so for the inks, I tried the, the egg white. I tried uh, a really, really good one, not my breakfast cereal, as I said. I like Bob's Ten Grains, and so as I was cooking Bob's Ten Grain, I took a spoonful of it, I popped it into this nice strainer, I smooshed it around into a jar, and uh, it came out with this really nice stuff. It's really kind of like toothpaste, only it jiggles. Um, and it, it has a little bit of a brown color, but it worked pretty well. Much better was this, which I made the same way, but from rice. So I just took white rice and I boiled it and I boiled it and I added more water and boiled it and I added more water and boiled it for about 45 minutes and then shoved it through this little strainer. It made great stuff. And in fact, that's what the Japanese have been using for mokuhanga for thousands of years um, as their, their paint base. They just mix this with a little tent, mix it with a little tent and it's great. Uh, so egg white, cereal, rice. Uh, I tried a little alcohol. That's, there's a whole field of alcohol-based inks. I wasn't very successful, um, but some people are using that really well. My favorite was honey. Oh my gosh, it makes a wonderful ink. It only has one big problem, which it takes forever to dry. <laughs> so you better be prepared to have your print hanging for quite a while before you move anything uh, near it because it, it doesn't dry very well. Um, what else? Those were the main things that I was using. Um, my brother reminded me that inky mushrooms would be a great source for tint. Uh, people love walnut. Walnut ink is very, very popular. I didn't have either of those. Um, my, I had uh, turmeric, 
Turmeric is fabulous. Turmeric, if you like yellow, is really, really good. Um, after a week of working with it, it began to look like something babies produce, but <laughs> I really loved it when I first started doing it. Uh, this one I made with some henna. If you ever do any henna rinses on your hair, it makes a great one. Um, this is my all-time favorite, beet juice. Just take a fresh beet and wrap it up in an aluminum foil packet, really tight so it's really well sealed. Bake it till it's done and then carefully punch the hole and nice beet juice will drip out. It gets a nice rich red color. Uh, what else did I use? Oh, I went to the burn pile, got the charcoal out of the burn pile and a razor blade and scraped and scraped and scraped. It was black. <laughs> it was kind of chunky though. <laughs> it was really, really hard to get this, um, to get this to the right consistency, but it was the right color. So I kept sticking with it. If you have like a wood stove, and you, or any kind of stove actually, and you get that kind of black soot around the edges or around the glass, perfect. That's in fact what they use for commercial, um, for commercial inks uh, a lot of times. So, um, could you use a mortar? Yes, you could, as a matter of fact. And I had one in my kitchen, and I, I don't want the charcoal in this, so I'm gonna still <laughs> use it. So, you need to get a secondhand mortar and pestle or build one from the Native American um, uh, rock skills that they, they have, yeah. I did end up fudging just a little bit. I took, I had some charcoal sticks and I had some really fat pencils that were technically in the art supply box and uh, with, a, with a razor blade and scraped and scraped and scraped and scraped and I got that to be very, very fine and that worked very well. The one other well, let's see. I also got really frustrated. I couldn't make anything blue. Now, Pam Beach tells me she's made great blue ink with berry juice. So she um, takes uh, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, and got a fine blue. I just took my pen. This is the kind, you know, the gel that has the ink that goes back and forth. I tried to saw it open. I failed. Uh, and so I just went like this for quite a long time on a piece of glass. And then I mixed that with my egg whites, and I got a really pretty nice blue out of that one. Um, ink. I think that's most of my ink journey. Um, if you have ink around the house, if you're somebody who uses a felt pen or I mean a dip pen or uh, stamp pads, um, you know, uh, black ink. It just takes a couple of drops mixed with any one of these binders, uh, and and you'll, you'll get some really nice things from that. Um, and the last one is th the cheat. Uh, gum Arabic is really, really handy. Not Most people don't have this around the house, but at, at one point when I was getting desperate that I wasn't really succeeding at ink, I used a little bit of this. But So that's my ink journey. Um, so we have plates, we have ink. Now, how do we make marks? Um, there's just no end to the ways that you can make marks. Um, favorites, a, a putty knife from the garage, credit card from the trash can, Q-tips, uh, skewers, yarn, more yarn, string, trash can, styrofoam I guess, toothbrush, uh, there's just you know potato bag, uh, toothpicks, matches, really no end of the things that you can use to make mar uh, marks with. Oh, here's some good one I used, um, leaves from outside. You can tell it's still April and we're at 4,000 feet, they're small. <laughs> uh, bubble wrap, Woo great. Um, cheesecloth, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with cheesecloth. Um, so all of those things are good for making marks. What else do I want to say? Uh, Elmer's glue is really handy. Rich, does Elmer's glue count as an art supply? No. No. Thank. Good. Right answer. Have the wood variety. <laughs> okay, wood variety. Yeah, you know, glue is very nice because a lot of these things that we're going to put on our making our marks with uh, the inks—they're just going to soak up the ink. But if you take a little bit of Elmer's glue 
uh, and mix it with a little bit of water and paint it on, it now becomes um, slick. And so the ink won't stick to the slickness of your plate, it'll stick to the paper that you've got. Um, what else? Oh, this was, this was fun. Now this should have been better than it was, but I'm still working out. This is liquid nails. Uh, uh, liquid nails or, or um, carpenter's friend or constructor's whatever, uh, adhesives, I guess they are. They were, I found about five dried up tubes in my garage. Um, but slice those open and um, then they make a nice little bumpy texture that you can push around, and move, etc. So that was nice. Uh, other handy items, contact paper was really fun. Shelf paper uh, was really great for making some stencils. Um, masking tape was handy. Aluminum foil, as you saw on that other one, was handy. And you know what else I do with aluminum foil? I make um, tiny bowls, you know, so that you're making these little bots of ink. You can make yourself a little bowl and pop stuff in there. So that was pretty handy. Wax paper was good for that, too. Uh, scissors are nice. Um, failure, I tried everything I could to make a roller. You know, this is what you wanted to have really handy. I never did find something that was going to work really well. These are made out of rubber, um, be, and the, so it's, they're just right for picking up ink and then letting go of it. Um, I tried toilet paper. I tried closet dowels. Um, I tried sticks. Um, so I kind of gave up on that as a method, but I'll bet somebody could phone in and tell us how to make a good roller. Uh, and so last, well, box cutters handy for cutting things, is cleanup. Uh, cleanup, it's really nice to have just some old phone books because then you're not going through tons of paper towels, which are, you know, we're all hoarding now. So if you use your phone book to clean up. Uh, this is just Dawn dish soap, 10% with 90% uh, water, and that will clean up just about anything. Uh, and a, a razor blade is pretty handy too because uh, some of my things got pretty sticky and I made a pretty big mess, and this was pretty good for getting it off of uh, glass. I worked on a glass table most of the time. I mean, a piece of glass um, just because nothing will get absorbed to it and so I can really see where my inks are going. So that was our make mark making. Um, my binders, honey, egg white, rice paste, alcohol, cereal. All right, let's talk then about how to make some of these things. Now I want to be sure that everybody knows this is not great art. <laughs> I can I can, I can do lots of things, but this is kitchen art, right? This is just making it from what we can find in the garage, etc. So I'm going to take you on my journey and hope that um, you will find it at least humorous and maybe inspiring to make you want to do something too. So project number one. All right, here's my little card. Uh, I made this using uh, a grocery sack. Uh, I took some little leaves from, uh, these are strawberry leaves that are coming out this, this time of year. I dipped the strawberry leaves in a mixture of my shaved black charcoal and honey. I really like the lines in it. I also took a piece of string and laid that in the honey and then pulled it up here. And then I took a Q-tip and I dipped that in my henna ink that I had made and I just made little dots around there for the berries and so my first card hey you know not bad I'm gonna make an envelope and send it to somebody that was number one and the problem emerged of the sticky honey so number two I took uh, the Oregon grape leaves which are evergreen so they're out all year I dipped them in my honey black honey and I tried to then use them as a stencil. So you know what a stencil is. The leaf is down, and I take my sponge, and I dip that in the turmeric, and I sponge over it, and I have an ugly mess. <laughs> I didn't think much of this one. But I did learn in the process of cleaning up that wiping with my turmeric ink was really beautiful. I love that yellow color, and I just took it by dipping a sponge in the turmeric and wiping and wiping and wiping and, and I learned that turmeric is very crumbly um, but if I let it dry just a little bit and brushed off 
in my hand, I got some nice yellows. So that led me to project number three. Okay, project number three, we're starting to rock, right? So I made this one by taking, I found a little bit heavier piece of paper. Um, I took some masking tape like this. I stuck it all over my sweater like this, okay? So you're getting it, so it's just barely tacky. Now it's got fuzz all over it. I was wearing something fuzzier at the time. And I put that on the paper to make a nice square, all right? So I made a nice square for it. Then I found my contact paper and I cut out a fish. Um, and I just did the outline of the fish. I don't know if you can see it, okay? And then, First, I took my sponge and my uh, turmeric ink, and I wiped it here, and the tape left a nice square e edge. Then I took my contact paper, and I put it down here. Then I took my bubble wrap. I dipped my bubble wrap in the blue ink. I popped that over the top, so now the ink goes everywhere except where the stencil is. I pulled off the stencil, had a fish. I carved some more holes in the fish. See those holes on the inside of the fish? I carved those holes, I put it back down. I got my black ink out and I used my favorite applicator, my finger, and I just rubbed the black into the little holes. And then you take the stencil back off pull the tape off and you have nice crisp edges, crisp edges. So I was kind of pleased, pleased with him. So you have a success, you go with it, right? And then you are humbled because it didn't really work the way you thought it would. <laughs> so a more ambitious stencil, right? So I made this stencil of this dancing girl I tried the same thing, only I was using computer printer. I did my turmeric wash. I took my stencil and put that over there. And I took my beet juice and I applied my beet juice with a Q-tip and it ran all over the place and made quite a, quite a mess. And then it wrinkled up and um, it, it kind of made a mess. But I liked her, so I kept going. I found some firmer paper and I did a tighter job with my, um, with my stencil and um, made, my, made my little dancing girl, which I liked. But then I got ambitious and I tried to make a border around it using a technique we'll talk about in a minute. It wasn't very good. So what did I do? I just cut it off and taped another piece of paper to the back. So I still have a card, but I just cut away the part that didn't work. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a total failure. So I like her, I'm gonna use her again. And I love beet juice, isn't that a luscious color? All right, then what happens? Okay. I wanted, now I wanted to try something different. So I don't know if you ever go to um, uh, a, like a fancy baby sh uh, wedding shower and they do give you a pedicure and then they give you these little slippers, you know, so that you can, your toenails won't get messed up. Uh, I, actually, I got these in Turkey because in Turkey they don't like you to wear your shoes inside and so they're always giving you little little slippers to wear. Well, guess what? It makes great printmaking material. So, I took a slipper, I cut it out, and I made Slipper Man. All right. This is uh, a piece of paper from a shopping bag. I cut him out of the shoe. I dipped it into my new black ink that I was perfecting as I went along. I smashed this here. Oh, before, isn't this cute? I put two leaves right up here for his eyes <laughs> because those are now between the ink and the paper, so that will stay white. So he had, a, well, in this case, it'll stay orange because the paper's orange. Uh, and then I came back in with a matchstick and put in his pupil. So uh, I liked him. So this is Slipper Man. Um, and I liked my slippers, so I kept going, and I cut out, you know, this is Oregon, put a bird on it. So I put a bird and a stick, and I, I got pretty pleased with this project. So here we are again with my bird on a grocery sack. 
with uh, black ink and then again my beet juice that I like and the beet juice applied with uh, Q-tip. So I like that one. I kept going. This one is on um, a sack, same design. Incidentally, this sack is from Wild Carrot, which is next door to the Fangle Gallery. If you haven't been down Main Street in Enterprise, you should, because uh, there's a print show in the window at uh, Wild Carrot's Fangle Gallery, and um, there are prints from six local artists that um, uh, I think you would enjoy. So walk down Main Street if you're out there taking an outing. And I made one more out of this on a piece of white shirt cardboard that I, I like. I think, I haven't cut it off because I think I'm going to score it, you know, right down here so it'll fold kind of like this. And I think I'll make a little book out of it and put some kind of paper inside of it. So it's, it makes a little book cover. So, bird, success. I like that one. Okay. Now, this was supposed to be the piece de resistance. Uh, it isn't. It didn't work out that well. But I'm on the right track. Um, this is a great technique for making collagraphs using um, the nails. Okay, so I took a plastic sheet. I looked at the beet juice and I said that is the exact color of the red osier dogwood right now this time of year. I don't know if you've looked at it, but it's just beautiful. It's so pretty and it's the color of beet juice. So I had this great vision of using beet juice for my for my um, dogwood and then my henna for I mean my uh, my turmeric for the the grasses and so I made my two plates with the the nails um, making this hard thing then I covered it with the um, Elmer's glue mixture so that it wouldn't absorb too much and um, then I put the beet juice on it but the beet juice is runny and so. When I've made these before, like this one I made them before, I used a roller and stiff ink, all the ink stayed on the top. When I did it this way with beet juice it all and no roller, it all ran and made little puddles. So my um, beautiful, um, my beautiful dogwood came out looking kind of like this. But you know what? If you put some white paper behind it, it looks kind of like a rose bush. And I decided I kind of like it. So um, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, I was using um, tissue paper that you get in the gift sacks when you, when you buy things, um, like from Wild Carrot. And I think I'm gonna cut it off, paste it onto this white using my, um, using my rice glue, which is great for that, and maybe put in a, a draw in a little butterfly or something like that. I did make one more attempt, uh, let me put something white behind it, uh, to do my dogwood. It was still too runny, but I did discover that I could take a credit card and dip the credit card in the ink and make some little wispy brushes. So, so I still have this one. I'm still going to work on it. This is the grass. This is the hardest nails um, relief here. I'm probably going to use a roller. Um, and figure out how to finish that one. So that project's still alive, TBD. And uh, last but not least, I needed to prove that it would work. So I took my fish stencil again, I've lost him, but my fish stencil again, put it down, took the hard as nails, dabbed it all on with a toothbrush. And so I, this, this is really bumpy, um, with a toothbrush all around it. Then I took my blue ink and I dabbed that all along with, um, I think, a sponge. Uh, did a little bit of wiping where I kind of made a mess. Um, by the way, um, dryer sheets, after you take them out of the dryer, great for wiping something like this. Uh, and so I got, my little, I got my little fish made. He's kind of cute. So you get a nice texture. So, um... That was it. Um, I think the lessons are, you know, I had some failures, um, but they were learning experiences, right? I had some moderate successes. Um, I have lots of ideas for more and next steps, um, maybe using some of my supplies. Um, but most of all, I got a deep appreciation for 
a thousand years of developing ink uh, and paper um, and things that I was just taking for granted as I would pull them, you know, off of uh, the, you know, a website or something like that, that um, I really have an appreciation for the technology and the learning that went with those, uh, especially in Japanese and Chinese papers, a long, long history of, of what they do there. Um, so Nancy, without the, mm -hmm. the roll, mm -hmm. you just, you use just what pressure you could with the sponge? With a sponge. Uh, with just leaning on it with a wooden spoon. A wooden spoon is great, especially if you're doing the ones with the, um, you know, the meat carton bottom, the styrofoam. Just take a wooden spoon. That's just the right amount of pressure. Do you use a, a rolling pin? You could, you could, I tried a rolling pin. You could use a rolling pin well on a relief print. Uh, oh, okay. But I couldn't get that on my, on my collagraph. I couldn't get a rolling pin, you know. Okay. just didn't have the, the give. So I'm betcha and there's somebody watching who could make a, tell us how to make a better roller. Yeah, that's fun. Any other questions or thoughts? Any questions from our audience? Seth? No? A lot of good love from people. Sarah <laughs> says that's what she can do with a full bottle of turmeric that she's had forever. Thank you for it. Molly says that. Yeah. Yeah, we've been looking for ways to get rid of that turmeric, right? It, I, I'm never sure what it really tastes like. I, I know what it looks like, but I'm not sure what flavor it's adding. It's very important, so maybe you can make it. Anti-inflammatory. Say it's edible art. Edible art. <laughs> edible. Cauliflower and turmeric, for sure. That's right, cauliflower and turmeric. And you know what? You could roll a cauliflower around. Oh, yeah. That could be really interesting. Um, you know what else you can do is if you've got an inky surface and, and instead of pressing it with a, the whole thing, just take a golf ball or an avocado and just roll around with it because it's kind of bumpy and you know, and so it'll just pick up the bumps uh, rather than all of it. So, um, you know, make a mess. <laughs> just make a mess <laughs> have some fun and uh, take advantage of what we have including what, time and materials one more what about if you were doing this with uh, young children what would be the easiest thing to start with with young kids the easiest is potato potatoes are perfect and Hibiscus. We did some tea, yeah. Matcha, she tea matcha green tea. But she used potato prints and she carved the prints and then printed it on, on paper. And it's all those nice relief. So, yep. yeah. Perfect. Just find something that you can cut out and yeah. dip it in it and put it on it. Or get your meat tray or your vegetable tray and find something to push in, like this match. Like your yeah. Our toothpick or match. Put that in there and then. Sponge it on. Lots of fun. Uh, yeah, that's pretty easy. Pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. 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 And big kids too. <laughs> big kids. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Okay, and thanks to the Josephi Center. I look forward to having everybody join us and someday we'll do a video down in the real print room with the wonderful press and the other resources. Um, can I just do a quick plug, which is um, printmaking is usually very collaborative and it's also something that it takes equipment that not a, every artist can afford and so having the Josephi Center here uh, to support artists with this kind of equipment that uh, we can't do individually is really really vital and uh, so we know we'll be back and we are glad that everyone is helping the center stay viable uh, through this time. Thank you.